there's been more people looking for this body than anybody. I mean, definitely more than Jimmy Hoffa. I think we've pretty much given up on Jimmy Hoffa. But they're still looking for the bones of Jesus today. So uh, Jesus, he was all, also equal in demanding admiration. See, because God says, worship only me. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Uh, look at John 5.23. It says this. Now this is all in the face of his accusers that he knows are eventually going to nail him to a, get him nailed to a tree. He says that all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son honoreth not the Father which has sent him. So, Jesus said repeatedly that if people would not honor him, they were not capable of honoring the Father. Like, impossible. Like, if your religion, quote, worships God, but they don't give Jesus his rightful place, it's not a religion. It's, it's a fairy tale. That's hate speech, isn't it? I know, I know, I know it is. But I didn't write the book, I just believe it. I believe the hate speech, because it saved my soul. Um, this would rule out any other religion, any other religion, as a sad form of godlessness that has no power, but in actuality is just as effective as a rabbit's foot or a horseshoe over the door. I mean, everything just falls and crumbles to the ground at that point. Or a penny, picking up a penny for good luck. It's ridiculous. Look at John chapter 8, verse 19 on this subject. John 8, 19. It says, Then said they unto him, Where is thy father? They're calling him a bastard, if you didn't catch that. Where is thy father? Jesus answered, You neither know me nor my father. If he had known me, you should have known my father also. So he's saying you can't even know God the Father unless you know Jesus. Look at John 15, 23. Jesus is equal in demanding admiration. John 15, 23. It says... He that hateth me hateth my father also. Wow. Those are strong words. Once again, from the mouth of Jesus. I'll read these couple verses to you. John 10, 1. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up in some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. And then in John 10, 7, Jesus said, I'm the door. What? Jesus, man. He, is, he doesn't leave you one inch of room to wiggle. You're either for me or against me. You hate me? You hate God. You think you're going to get to God without me? No way. You think there's another way? You think you can do penitence? You think you can uh, get your ancestors baptized for the dead? I mean, you know, you, you think that your good works are going to do something? No, no, no. You hate me. You hate God. But so we looked at Jesus as God is equal with the Father, but Jesus as a man, dual nature, he was obedient to the Father. We're back in John chapter 5, and look at verse 19 says, Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things, he, uh, what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. In Hebrews 5.8 says, Though he were a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. You ever thought about that? Jesus had to learn something while he was here? Jesus learned. Wow. He learned obedience through suffering. 
you think about where Jesus came from. Jesus came from glory, amen? I mean, he had his throne. He was high and lifted up. You know, and the, the, uh, his robe, you know, just filled the temple with glory. I mean, you think about where Jesus was at. You think he knew anything about suffering? He saw it. He saw it, right? But you know what the devil would, would have said? You don't understand these people. They got to suffer. You're up here in glory. You don't understand them. You know what? You say you love them, but I mean, really, look at you. You're just sitting here in heaven. You know, and I mean, I'm down there. I mean, you know, because I can go to and fro like in Job. I'm down there. I see. I see what they're up to. You know, I understand them better than you. You know, and so you see how the accuser could have have something to point at him. like, oh yeah? Huh? What are you doing? Why are you getting up? Huh? Why are you leaving? Where are you going to go? No! He's down there! Then he runs down there. He's like chasing him around for 33 and a half years. Oh, I'm going to get him. I'm gonna, I'll kill him. He nails him to the cross. Ah, it's finally done. Wait, wait, what's going on? That rock's moving. No! <laughs> and our Superman, he's like, <laughs> you know and honestly I mean one, one day we'll do a class on what, what actually happened but I mean really Superman <laughs> couldn't stop him but why would Jesus need obedience see he needed obedience to be subject to the law now this was the law that no man could attain to Every man would fall short. That's why they had to do the sacrifices. Constantly, constantly, man. There's a bloodbath. But God would never bow the knee to wicked humanity, okay? Because if God said, look, you know how oh, your sin's not that bad? Hey, come up into heaven anyway. You know, if sinners went to heaven with their sin, heaven would be hell. Heaven is not a place of sin. So God will only accept perfection, and perfection was only possible through the cross of Jesus Christ. Him being God, that is. If he was not God, then the cross was just a big waste of time. Number one, he needed obedience to be subject to the law, like Noah, Abraham, Joseph, who was the greatest type of Christ in the Old Testament. Remember Old Testament Joseph? Uh, remember his brethren ditched him? And then he was still raised up to glory. And all the brethren came back and started worshiping him. Just like that dream he had, remember? Greatest type of Christ. But you think about how these people lived back then. Think about the life of Moses or Jonah or Elijah. See, they all needed to prove their obedience to the Lord. And they did. They sure did. But surely Jesus would have to prove the same, wouldn't he? Being obedient. What about Job? The Bible says, Job, who is a perfect and upright and one that feareth God and sheweth evil. He also had to learn the lesson of suffering that taught him obedience. He lost all his children, his livestock, and servants in one day. And he didn't curse God. Wow. Then gets worse he got struck with boils from head to toe only to have his wife come and tell him curse God and die Job learned obedience so Jesus he needed this obedience utterly and completely to keep God holy to keep God holy why because man's righteousness could never attain to God's holiness ever like anything at all or the cross of Jesus Christ was just a big waste of time. Think about it. If you could reach God yourself, why would he have to die? Amen. That's not too deep, but it's very logical. Why would he have to die? Why can't he just sit up in his throne, man, and, and just wait for you to just reach this level of uh, perfection that, that you have, obviously? 
Until we ask your wife, that is. Amen. <laughs> she knows you a little better than we do. But uh, so Jesus, as a man, he learned obedience to the Father, but he needed obedience also to be subject to humanity. We talked about it. How could he be your mediator if he didn't understand you? That'd be like if, if you have a, a translator, you know, we'll say he's an ambassador, you know, for something like India, okay? And there's, there's a, a, an English speaker who comes. If this ambassador, this translator doesn't understand English, how is he going to get the stuff to the king of India or whatever? He has to understand both parties, right? He would have had to spend some time learning English. Oh, ran out of time there, but we're still going. I'm sorry. But, so he needed this obedience so to be subject to humanity. So now he can be your, me your mediator. Because everybody before could just merely follow the law that God prescribed. Amen. Jesus surpassed the law. I mean, I'm, think about this. The Holy of Holies was on earth, right? In a tabernacle. I mean, badger skins. I mean, there's, there's all that stuff, you know, we talked about in the Bible. It's just covered. I mean, you can see it. It's right there. When Jesus raised from the dead, something ripped open, remember? And the lights were out inside, which they were shocked by that, too, because the glory of the Lord had departed. Ichabod. But all these priests back then could do is they could just walk in, you know, and just put the blood on the altar, walk in, put the blood on the altar, right there on the earthly tabernacle. Jesus, our Superman, he flies up there, and he puts the blood on the altar in the Holy of Holies in heaven. How are you going to beat that, priest? <laughs> you're going to tell me you're going to forgive my sins when I have a high priest up in heaven that places his blood on that altar? Not numerous times. Not every week. Once. Amen. You want to talk about power in the blood? When, when he did that, when he, think of when he did that, when he placed his blood on that altar in heaven, it didn't stay on that altar. It started spreading. It started spreading into the whole universe. And it covered earth. What? I mean, I'm talking it went down into the dirt. I mean, it's in the air. I mean, what are you talking about, Randy? I'm talking about if they buried you in a 50-foot deep pit, you could get born again. Right there. I'm talking about if, if they brought you to the bottom of the ocean, you could get born again right there. The blood of Jesus is always available. I mean, they, they could fly you like an astronaut to Jupiter. You can get born again on Jupiter. Amen. The blood of Jesus has just... See, when, when he does something, he doesn't do it halfway. He doesn't say, okay, I'll see you next week for your confession. Huh? No, he says, it is finished. Wow. Thank you, Lord. But Jesus surpassed it. Going into that heavenly holy of holies. Look at Philippians 2. I think this is a verse worth looking at. They all are, amen. Forgive me for saying that. Philippians 2, verse 6. And it says this, Who being in the form of God, Jesus Christ, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. See that? But made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, amen, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven things and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So clearly we've seen Jesus as God was equal, is equal with God. Jesus as a man was obedient to the Father. You gotta remember the dual nature. Our last thing here, if you believe that, we're actually coming to the end, 
is Jesus as God and man will execute judgment. Not the Father. Huh? I mean, Jesus, he, he comes down and he's throwing around his weight. He's like, look, man, I make judgment and my judgment's right. 